Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I, we're looking forward to an excellent talk on Moya Moya with Dr. Smith and, um, um, and my, Dr. Scott. And so we want to thank everybody for joining us and uh, please use the interactive feature. Uh, we will be able to answer questions. The questions that you have, we'll present them to the speakers. Um, so please don't hesitate to do that after um, the talks. Thanks again. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce our two speakers today. Um, they're both wonderful surgeons and also have been wonderful mentors to myself. Um, so first off, um, we're going to have uh, Dr. R. Michael Scott, uh, who is the neurosurgeon in chief emeritus uh, from Boston Children's, as well as the family chair in uh, pediatric neurosurgery from Harvard Medical School. And he really, uh, as all of you know, uh, pioneered indirect bypass for Moya Moya and um, really had, had a tremendous career helping these children. And then next up, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Ed Smith speak, um, who uh, now does all of these cases at Children's. Um, and Dr. Scott was a, has been a mentor to him as well. Um, Dr. Smith is the Director of Pediatric Cerebrovascular Neurosurgery, uh, Co-Director of uh, Cerebrovascular Neurosurgery and Interventions, and Co-Director of the Head, Neck, and Skull Base Surgery Program uh, at Boston Children's, as well as he has the or Michael Scott Chair in Neurosurgery at Boston Children's. So uh, with that, we'll get started with both talks. Feel free to use the Q&A uh, button throughout the talks as well. And then we'll ask uh, the questions uh, at the end to try to have this be as interactive as possible. But thank you again uh, to both of you for speaking today and um, we're thrilled to get started. Hi, I'm Mike Scott. I'm gonna talk about surgery for Moya Moya disease in the pediatric population. and. One of the things I'm going to do here is going to talk about the beginnings, as Heather and Tove asked me to talk about, and then talk to you about some of the long-term issues that we've discovered in our pediatric um, population. Uh, so uh, I'm going to assume that our audience knows pretty much what Moya Moya disease is. I realize there must be some people in the audience who don't. For those who don't, this is a progressive disease of the internal carotid artery at the skull base intracranially that causes narrowing down of the vessel and progressive ischemia and usually typically in children, symptoms of stroke. I love this picture from the Japanese literature talking about why this term moya moya, which means puff of smoke was used. And this is a course the angiogram on a patient with Moya Moya, and you can see this cloud of collateral vessels going through the basal ganglia and the image next to it of a puff of smoke from one of the uh, articles, which I think is wonderfully illustrates the problem. Um, in terms of the beginnings and how we got started doing this surgery, I, I wanna show a, a little bit about this case, which is some of you have seen these pictures before. This was actually the first child that I ever operated on for Moya Moya disease. This was a 13 month old girl who was referred by pediatric neurologists specifically to me to do a bypass on her. She had had three strokes by the time she was 13 months old and uh, her scans had very rapidly deteriorated. Her uh, arteriograms revealed Moya Moya disease and these are her um, CT scans that were done in that era. There was no MRI in, in 1982. And you can see she started out with this stroke. And then just a couple of months later, her brain was very severely involved with uh, ischemic damage. We went ahead um, to consider her for bypass. Now, I wanted to do an STAMCA bypass. Yashagil had done one in a child in 1972. Um, and I had spent in 1974, just after I finished my residency, I had spent three months with the Asher Gill learning microsurgery. And I came to Boston and did a lot of bypasses in adult patients. And so in this child, I thought, well, this is going to be no problem. I'll do a bypass in this child. But when we got her to surgery, her scalp and cortical blood vessels were minuscule and they were far too small that I thought I could create a, a viable anastomosis. So we instead did this encephalo arteriosynangiosis, 
that was described by Matsushima in 1980, uh, just two years previous to this operation. Now, the operation that Matsushima described, illustrated here in his text, shows this technique that he utilized, which essentially involved dissecting out the superficial temporal, uh, doing a small craniotomy, making a linear incision in the dura, and just suturing that vessel into that linear incision. Uh, well, anyway, that's what we did. Um, and when we did that on this little girl and we arteriogrammed her six months after surgery, there was very little new collateral from the surgery and it was not very effective. And uh, Harold Hoffman, who some of a name that some of you may know, who was uh, one of the pioneering neuro pediatric neurosurgeons at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, noticed the same thing and reported this at an uh, ASPN meeting in 1984. Uh, I thought that it didn't make sense to me that Matsushima's technique would work if the vessel was just sewn into the dural opening. And I thought that the vessel really, there would be no new collateral unless the brain surface and the, uh, was exposed to the donor blood supply and that they were in close apposition. And I thought the arachnoid and the dura needed to be widely opened and that the donor vessel had to be kept in contact with the brain surface in order for this surgery to be effective. So I thought the larger the craniotomy, and Ed's gonna talk a little bit about this, the larger the craniotomy, the more opportunity for more spontaneous collateral to develop from the surgery. And I thought dural blood supply would also be important. So it was important to provide as much dural surface to the brain as possible. So the Peelson angiosis was the procedure that we did. I'll, I'll show you the technique of that very briefly. It was first performed at Boston Floating. That's a hospital for Tufts, a medical center in 1984. We reported it at the ASPN meeting in 1985 and then wrote the technique up in 1991 and it was fully described by Dave Adelson in 1995. And this essentially was the technique. This is a, of course, a blow up illustration of the brain under the microscope. We used this arachnoid knife to open up the arachnoid here. And then we would try with jeweler's forceps to separate the arachnoid widely over the surface of the brain as fully as we possibly uh, could. And then after we'd opened the arachnoid, we would take some sutures of uh, teno monofilament nylon, pass them through the outer surface of the pia and through the adventitia of the donor superficial temporal artery to keep that vessel in uh, apposition with the brain surface so the collateral could grow into the brain from that superficial temporal. And here is the completed uh, picture of the surgery before closure with the artery here. There are sutures along the edge here, uh, applying it to the pia. And you can see the dura has been filleted into about six uh, flaps, allowing extra surface area of the dura also to lie in apposition with the brain to provide collateral to brain surface. So at any rate, we wrote this, these patients up uh, in a five-year follow-up of them and published it in the journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics. And what we noted, of course, that was the operation, and all of you know this, is very effective to stop ischemic stroke in these patients. This graph represents the time of surgery, these diamonds represent the strokes that the patients had preoperatively. And you can see postoperatively, these lines are pretty clear. There are a couple of exceptions to that, but by and large, these patients were more than, followed for more than five years or at least five years uh, had a marked reduction in their ischemic stroke rate. So um, what did we think at that point determined the long-term outcome of these patients. Uh, I felt very strongly at that time that the patient's neurologic status at the time of the initial diagnosis 
before the surgery was the main determinant of how they were going to do. If the patient had multiple strokes or a large dominant hemisphere stroke before the surgery, no matter how effective the surgery was, they were going to have a poor long-term prognosis in the majority of patients. Other comorbidities also would play an important role, I thought, uh, particularly for patients who had comorbidities like leukemia or congenital syndromes like Down syndrome. And I thought that would probably lead to reduced long-term function as well. So recently, we've been looking at the long-term morbidity and mortality in our pediatric population. And I, we were interested in trying to find out what was happening to these patients very late. And if there were deaths and neurologic morbidities, what were they due to? Now, let me tell you the substrate of this patient population from 1988 through 2016, when I stopped operating, Ed Smith and I had operated on 460 patients who were ages 21 and under for Moya Moya disease. Virtually all of these patients underwent that same procedure that I described to you, the Peelson angiosis. There were a couple of exceptions to that, but most were Peelson angiosis. We identified from this group of 460 patients, 16 patients who had a late significant neurologic event or death. Now I define late when looking at this patient population as an event that occurred one year or more after surgery. Uh, we wanted to categorize these events to determine if they were, uh, if there were common events or etiologies in this patient population. And also, most importantly, could these late events have been predicted or prevented? Now, we classified these events into four groups. Number one, intracerebral or intraventricular hemorrhage. Interestingly, there were eight late interventricular intracerebral hemorrhages in this patient population. I'll, I'll go, describe these in more detail in a moment. There were deaths due to systemic comp complications related to the primary conditions that were associated with the Moya Moya disease or the preoperative disabilities of the patients in five patients. There were deaths following the development of new malignant brain tumors in two patients. And one patient developed a central retinal artery occlusion resulting in blindness. I'm gonna describe briefly representatives from each of these groups. How about the patients with intraventricular hemorrhage? Now these occurred in this patient population in as little as two years after surgery to as late as 27 years after surgery. And here's the ages after surgery in this patient population ranging from two to 27 years. All but one of these patients initially presented with ischemic symptoms. So they didn't present with hemorrhagic strokes, they presented with ischemic strokes. One late bleed in this patient group was not fatal, but it was terribly disabling. And this was a patient who was a school teacher, had her uh, hemorrhage 27 years after her surgery and has remained totally disabled since then and is dependent for all her activities on daily living, but she survived. Two patients in this group had received radiotherapy for hypothalamic optic system gliomas at ages three and five. And I'll discuss that more in a moment as well. Now here's some of these a couple of these patients with the hemorrhages. Uh, this uh, was a patient who presented with TIAs and one year postoperatively, her arteriogram demonstrated excellent results for her synangiosis on the left and very good results on the right. She was stable neurologically for 24 years and every two years as per our protocol, she got yearly MRI, MRA study showing robust synangiosis but collateral bilaterally and no new strokes. She had a sudden fatal 
intraventricular hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage at age 40. She had been taking 81 milligrams of aspirin since surgery and her routine physicals had revealed no systemic illnesses or hypertension. Her post-mortem exam revealed no etiology, no determined etiology for the bleed. Here was her MRA that was carried out six months prior to her bleed. You can see how extensive the moya moya was. Both middle cerebrals gone, anterior cerebrals gone, posterior cerebral severely involved as well. And she had robust collateral over both hemispheres. This had been stable for years. Here was her pre-death CT scan showing this hemorrhage in the uh, right basal ganglia rupturing, rupturing into the ventricular system and the post-mortem specimen showing the large hemorrhage here. The walls of the hemorrhage cavity were looked at as well as the clot itself. No abnormal blood vessels could be seen or determined uh, as a cause for the hemorrhage, although one realizes that many of these could have been disrupted in the course of the bleed. Here's an, another case, uh, again, with a bleed. She, at age three, had undergone conventional external beam radiation therapy for a hypothalamic optic system glioma. She presented with a small right basal ganglion hemorrhage. This is the only one in the group who presented with a hemorrhage. Uh, after her arteriogram demonstrated bilateral moya moya disease, she underwent bilateral pelosynangiosis synangiosis in 1988. By the way, this was either my first or my second Moya Moya operation after I came over to Children's Hospital. And this patient was not going to do well, unfortunately. Two days later, she suffered a left, left basal ganglion ischemic stroke, not a hemorrhage, but an ischemic stroke, following which re, she remained pseudobulbar and dependent. Subsequently, she remained in a group living home for the rest of her life, but was stable neurologically and didn't have any more events or strokes for 27 years until she had this fatal interventricular hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage occurring at age 40. She had taken 81 milligrams of aspirin all her life and had had stable MRI, MRI five years prior to her death. I'll show you her studies as well. This was her MRI, MRA that was done five months prior to her fatal hemorrhage. You can see the collateral over both hemispheres here. This finding in the region of probably uh, lenticular striates was shown on other blood vessels, on other scans and sequences to be collateral, transcerebral collateral. There was no aneurysm there. She's going to end up with a hemorrhage over here. Here's her pre-morbid uh, CT scan showing this hemorrhage here in the left posterior part of the thalamus rupturing into the ventricular system. Uh, and from which she died. Here are some of the other cases with intraventricular hemorrhages. One patient with a T cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia as a comorbidity. He had received cranial irradiation and developed his moya moya on that basis. His arteriograms postoperatively never showed very good collateral coming from his synangiosis and also showed an aneurysm on the lenticulostriates that came and went on sequential ang angiograms. His bleed was on the side of the aneurysm, I think probably was almost certainly from that, although it was never really proven. And you can see here's the patient with radiation therapy. An interesting patient here with Facey syndrome. Many of you in the audience will know about this syndrome. These are the children that have these facial hemangiomas and have other congenital anomalies. But these patients, in my experience, have done very well. This patient operated on at age one, at, at, 19, at age 19, had a fatal intraventricular hemorrhage. Here's a patient with Korean ancestry, the only one in this group who was of Asian extraction. Here's another one with radiation and uh, and uh, but this patient had a pontine hemorrhage, which was fatal, probably due to radiation vasculopathy. And I'm going to talk about the role of radiation in a second.
Now, we had five patients who uh, died due to Moya Moya related comorbidities or severe pre existing neurologic deficits. I'm going to summarize these very briefly. This patient had Down syndrome with very debilitating preoperative bilateral strokes and then had a self mutilating syndrome. She opened her wound four years after her surgery, developed a cerebral infection, cerebritis, and died. A very unusual set of circumstances, I think, for a late complication. This is a patient with congenital peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis who died a cardiac death despite multiple cardiac interventions. She was uh, operated on at age 18 and died at age 29. Again, not a neurological cause for uh, her death. And here's a patient who died in his sleep with severe inanition, bilateral strokes preoperatively. A patient with aplastic anemia who died of bone marrow failure. And a patient, very interesting syndrome with a chromosome one inversion, which I did not know about. This is a syndrome that causes concomitant renal failure. The patient was undergoing a renal transplant and died of complications from the renal transplant um, at age 20, uh, having been operated on at age eight for his Moya Moya disease. These are the patients with radiation induced malignant brain tumors. Again, this can't be attributed necessarily to the Moya Moya disease, uh, to the Peelson angiosis either. Uh, these are complications from the primary radiation. And you can see in both of these cases, these one with a brainstem glioma with widespread invasion and another with malignant meningioma that invaded the brainstem. Both of these patients were treated with modalities that we would not use nowadays. This was an NF case treated for a hypothalamic optic system tumor at age five. I don't think anyone would be doing that nowadays. And this was a patient treated for craniopharyngioma with conventional radio, radiation therapy when she was 10 years of age and she died at age 27 from this malignant ten, subtentorial and tentorial meningioma that invaded the brainstem. Now, I'll say something about this uh, patient who had the central retinal artery occlusion, which I think is a fascinating problem that I'm going to need some help solving. This was a six-year-old girl who suffered a stroke while she was under anesthesia for a urological procedure. Eventually, she underwent a workup for the stroke and was found she had bilateral Moya Moya disease, and she was operated on at age seven. She went on to be stable with no further strokes or neurologic events until 37, 30 years later, when she suffered the acute onset of a left central retinal artery occlusion resulting in blindness in that eye. An MRA study showed that now her left cervical internal carotid artery that was previously demonstrated to be patent on multiple MRI, MRA studies was now occluded. She had been on aspirin all during this time and had no other risk factors. And here's her MRA studies. Here's her MRA that was carried out three years prior to the event. You can see this patent cervical internal carotid artery. Theoretically, it must have been the supply of her ophthalmic artery, although we don't know that for certain. And here was the MRA that was done at the time of her central retinal artery occlusion, showing that that internal carotid artery in the neck was now occluded, despite her antiplatelet medication. So what can we say about this series of late deaths in Moya Moya disease patients? Some late deaths, I think, can't be prevented by neurosurgical measures. There are these comorbidities that I've described to you uh, such as the chromosomal anomalies, the congenital cardiac anomalies, the other comorbidities associated with Moya Moya that may run their own course and which can't, the Pielsen angiosis or any surgery for Moya Moya can't prevent. Even in young patients, I think, however, significant bilateral strokes preoperatively are going to predict a poor prognosis and also may predict a late death 
merely from inanition and um, pneumonias and so on as our patients died from. Radiation therapy in the pediatric patient adds significant long-term hazards. And as I've gotten older, I've been more and more concerned about the use of radiation therapy in the young patient, regardless of the reason for it. Our patients that I've talked to you about today all had conventional external beam radiation as the predisposing factor in the development of their moya moya. But I don't think that the proton beam therapy or a stereotactic radiotherapy is going to reduce the incidence of late development of secondary tumors, but the jury is still out on that. There was no prodrome for any of these bleeds, and there were no vascular changes noted on their sequential MRI, MRA studies. So perhaps the current MRA resolution isn't good enough to predict when a hemorrhage is going to be eminent. I'm not sure about that, and I'm hopeful that we're going to learn more with time. So what's interesting to me is all the patients who bled were on aspirin at the time of their intracranial hemorrhage, but there was no history of easy bruising or significant bleeding in any other organ in any of these patients. So in conclusion, I would say we're continuing to recommend long-term follow-up of our operated Moya Moya patients with every two-year MRI, MRA studies. But you may wonder what the utility of that's going to be. I'm hopeful that we're going to come to some conclusions or solutions about what's happening on these patients that leads to these intracranial hemorrhages. Aspirin has been recommended to prevent thrombus formation in all our patients because of the narrowing of the Moya Moya disease and the possibility of subsequent embolus. But you can see it didn't prevent the occlusion of the carotid artery in our patient with the central retinal artery occlusion. She, by the way, is now on aspirin and Plavix. And I'm very worried about the status of her opposite carotid again, which has very little runoff flow. And I'm worried about her losing vision in that eye. But the interventionalists and the carotid surgeons don't see any other option for managing her. None of these measures presented, prevented the deaths and complications in our patients. One of the things I think is probably going to be important is yearly general physical examinations in all of these post-operative patients, regardless of their age, in particular to detect the development of hypertension, which has been noted to occur late in a certain number of Moya Moya disease patients, uh, for some for renal artery stenosis reasons and some for unknown reasons. And I think if hypertension is present, it has to be treated aggressively, lest there be a problem with intracranial hemorrhage. And finally, I'd like to say that for any surgeon operating on a patient with Moya Moya, I think it's important to keep an eye on these patients long-term. And um, I think all of us should arrange for long-term follow-up of these cases and recording of their status on a regular basis so we learn more about these long-term effects. There are a couple of series from Japan that report on hemorrhages intracranial in Moya Moya operated pediatric patients. And I'm afraid we're going to see more of this as time progresses. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And um, I enjoyed the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Heather and Toba for the invitation. Thank you for talking. Um, so I think we'll have uh, Dr. Smith go ahead and speak. And uh, those of you who have questions, if you can start shooting them through on the Q&A function, I uh, will ask the questions after the second talk. Right. Well, uh, it's always tough to follow Dr. Scott. It doesn't seem quite fair, you know, and uh, I, uh, I always feel like I'm a little bit sort of behind the eight ball here. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a this is a formal thing. I know that the Miami is very, very serious about things. So I thought I'd get all dressed up and I put on my formal Miami orange hat here because <clears throat> I know it's late in the day and people get zoomed out. So uh, I won't wear this the whole talk, but I just want you to know if we have our live meetings, I, I'm trying to trying to fit in with a crowd, you know, it's a little chilly up here in Boston. So, um, you know, Dr. Scott had talked about the history of Moya Moya and where it started. And then obviously that's an incredible foundation. I was sort of asked to lead into this and learning from Dr. Scott and then learning from other things like tumors or other fields and, and how we treat these. 
So I know Dr. Scott had mentioned at the beginning, you know, what is Moya Moya? And I think one of the things that's changed in the past few years is an evolution of what Moya Moya actually is. And, and this has been a modern sort of advancement. I went to the most, you know, definitive resource I could find. So I went to Wikipedia and uh, in Wikipedia, it says Moya Moya is narrowed arteries. And they're not wrong, as Dr. Scott would say to me from time to time, uh, not that often, but once in a while. Uh, but I think, you know, that the evolution of the knowledge of Moya Moya has really changed over the years. Originally, it was a radiographic diagnosis. And, you know, the crowd probably knows here the Suzuki grading, where you get worse narrowing over time. This is sort of a, you know, Miami attending where they've got great circulation. This might be sort of a Boston Children's, uh, you know, attending where they have a little bit of missed area because of some narrowing. This might be a vascular person, you know, where there's really no blood supply, very minimal. And this is an orthopedic surgeon where there's nothing going on in the brain. But you have this graded narrowing over time. And, and this is what the way the diagnosis was first made. We got a little smarter. People began to understand that there was pathologic differences there. This is sort of, Mike had mentioned the importance of aspirin uh, and it's really smooth muscle cell overgrowth and contrast the adult sort of uh, overgrowth of, of atheroma or cheeseburger juice in the middle of the arteries. And you can see here, this is really the, the little slit of open lumen that they're living off of. And it, it underscores the, the risk of like thrombus formation like you see here and why it's so important to keep these kids hydrated, especially children that have lower blood pressures and slight fluctuations can really increase the risk of thrombus. We've looked at growth factors and other things that contribute to the secondary angiogenesis you see in these collaterals. And then, you know, most recently, I think we've really come to understand that these are probably multiple different diseases, uh, such as the ACTA2 genetic form that has been described, the big one, which is the RNF213 in, in a lot of the East Asian populations, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, where there's many different diseases that have the same common features in their end arteriopathy. Um, and, and really what it looks like when you look at this is, you know, this is the radiographic diagnosis. This is the pathologic diagnosis. So you have this over, smooth muscle cell overgrowth and tiny lumens. Then you have a mix of sort of acute and chronic strokes. And you can see here in the circle of Willis, the posterior circulation looks pretty fine, but anteriorly you have all these little collaterals, kind of like back roads. I know you have no traffic in Miami, but up here in Boston, you know, these little back roads get clogged. And, that, and that's really what we're seeing is pre-existing vessels swelling and then overgrowth of new vessels angiogenically. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Another thing that's different, you know, for our adult colleagues versus our kids is that pediatric moya moya is different than adult moya moya. And this is something we've only learned over the past decade or two, but unlike uh, uh, adults, you know, 6% of all pediatric strokes after the neonatal period are associated with moya moya. So it's, it's a growing recognition of how important this disease is. And they much more commonly present almost exclusively with ischemic disease, either TIAs or strokes. Whereas, uh, you know, in adults, they're not most commonly, but more commonly presenting with hemorrhage, probably due to the higher blood pressure, the risk of, of smoking and that hypertensive microaneurysms. So kids are different. And a big takeaway here, I think that we've learned in the past decade or two is these subgroups of disease, you know, neurofibromatosis, Mike talked about brain radiated kids, Down syndrome, cardiac anomalies, sickle cell kids. I mean, there's a huge different cohorts. And for all your colleagues outside of neurosurgery, the hematologists, the Down syndrome, complicated care syndrome kids, uh, the, the brain tumor groups, recognizing this risk has really saved lives. And, and Mike really has pioneered identifying that these are multiple different diseases that present with the same end finding. So one big thing is neurosurgeons, we get asked a lot, especially pediatric folks, is how do you treat these kids? And I know the adult world, they do 8,000 tests with Diamox and, and perfusion studies and goodness knows what else. But, but really in kids, at least at children's, we've gotten very good at trying to minimize testing to, to maximize the most bang for your buck, to minimize sedation, minimize risk to kids, radiation exposure, et cetera. Uh, we use uh, diffusion uh, studies for acute stroke and this IV sign in flare, which is very important in anatomic. I'll talk about more of that later. But we really don't use CT, perfusion, diamox, anything else. As Mike said, we start the kids on aspirin, multidisciplinary um, consultations, and a big thing is we continue to do catheter angiography. And this raises the question, you know, even now in 2021, 
why do we do angiograms? They're kind of old school. We got fancy schmabadoodle, you know, perfusion, doodly do MRIs. Why are we doing these old school angiograms? They cost money, they have some risks, they take time. And so we studied this. And what we found is the real answer is transdural collaterals, right? And for those that don't, you know, see these a lot, these are the spontaneous ingrowth of vessels, either from the middle meningeal or scalp vessels, but some external carotid supply that goes to supply the brain. And you can see that here where the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe have these spontaneous vessels in moya moya. Um, the reason this is important is if we do a craniotomy here and you open the dura widely, like Mike showed in his pictures, and you inadvertently cut these vessels, all of a sudden you have a huge stroke all over in other parts of the brain. And this really has been very important for us. We quantified this and found that nearly half of Moya Moya patients will have transdural collaterals somewhere in their head. And about a quarter of them may have transdural collaterals in the operative field if you do a bilateral operation. So it's really an important thing. It's more common in advanced disease, the higher Suzuki grades. Um, and importantly, in addition to the sort of safety issue, it reduces 42% of perioperative strokes if you don't cut into these. The other thing is that it's a prognostic picture, and I'll talk about this in the biology in a second, that these kids are the best kids to grow good blood vessels with indirect bypass. It's a, it's a biological crystal ball, if you will. So this has been very, very helpful and justifies angiograms. The other big question we get a lot now in the past decade or so is, why are you operating on asymptomatic kids? Should you do it? Because if they're fine, leave them alone. And that's a valid question. So we tried to justify this with a report. And, and you know, we said, well, look, if you're symptomatic, you're having TIAs, you've had strokes, makes sense to revascularize if you got Moya Moya. But what about the asymptomatic kids? And with the big rise of imaging for other reasons, Timmy fell off the bus, brain tumor imaging for NF kids, et cetera, that proliferation of images has led to a proliferation of the diagnosis of Moya Moya. Should you operate on an asymptomatic kid? Yes or no? Or if so, when do you do it? So we looked at about 80 or so kids that had completely normal scans at some point, uh, and then later on developed Moya Moya. And we followed them or looked at their, their development of scans over time. And again, they sort of mirrored the Moya Moya population. They were more commonly female than male. They're about nine years old. And we followed them for about five years on average. What we found and what we defined for progression, you know, was a radiographic progression of either arteriopathy, so their blood vessels got narrow, like Moya Moya. If they got flare signal, this IV sign I talked about before, the slow flow, or if they had evidence of new strokes in the right arterial distribution. So those were our three things, stroke, IV sign, arteriopathy. And what we found is that of those kids, about half of them had one of those three things as radiographic progression within five years. So this is a dynamic disease. It gets worse over time and we can document it in black and white on imaging. Importantly, the takeaway that we also found is not just it happens, but the real red flag, the practical take home is if they develop IV sign, then that is a herald of stroke probably within about a year to a year and a half. So that new IV sign progression is probably your red flag that it's time to think about surgery. And that's very helpful for parents and docs to figure out when to treat. Clinically, they also progress and they'll have headache, TIAs, stroke, seizures, again, in about half the kids. So this is a real deal. They get worse and it probably justifies surgery in these asymptomatic patients. About half of them will progress. We're not perfect at figuring out who yet, but I think that the fact that the numbers are so high and especially the ones that have new IV sign that we can make a very good case, at least in experienced centers with good surgeons, that it makes sense to operate in asymptomatic kids. So we've used this, and this is now incorporated in the American Heart Association guidelines that just came out this past year. Um, what's the end result of indications? What do we do now since Mike started this? Well, the takeaway is if you've got real radiographic Moya Moya, if you have IV sign, and they're medically stable for the OR, we will generally operate on them unless they're neurologically devastated, again, given Dr. Scott's previous evidence, or if the diagnosis is unclear or extremely early. So really what that is, just do it. I mean, I really think this is a disease where we can show that the surgery works and we can show that waiting has potentially devastating consequences. And I think this is justified now with an evidence-based approach. Um, how do we treat the kids? So we've talked about how we work them up, 
what the justifications for surgery are, um, what do we do with them when, when we get them? Um, you know, you, you is a very experienced group here. Here's a little picture of Boston with our traffic. But as you know, if the internal carotid is blocked, like taking 93 up into Boston, uh, you can then take 128. You take a different route, use the external vessels, whether it's with a direct or an indirect bypass. Now, in kids in particular, again, a newer piece of information here is that We've always sort of assumed indirect is better. A big meta-analysis with over 4,000 cases recently supported that and showed that, that indirect bypass is probably the way to go with kids. Um, more importantly, uh, you know, if you think about the other big centers in the U.S., one of the big adult centers is at Stanford, and even the Stanford group in a recent paper suggested that indirect bypass is probably the best way to go for kids. So I would suggest to you that this evolution in surgical technique is something that is not just word of mouth, but is now sort of evidence-based. Um, there are other advances in treatment, which are maybe not as glamorous, but I really feel that protocol-based care, you know, having the same kids get the same treatments has helped us to reduce our stroke rate quite a bit. And this isn't super fancy. This isn't sort of a glamorous thing to do, but they all get admitted the night before. They all stay on their aspirin through the day before surgery. Um, they get EEG monitoring during the surgery to check for slowing so you can make real-time adjustments. You keep them on one and a quarter and other station or, or relaxing post-operative nausea and vomiting reduction uh, events in our ICU. And the point is, this is all protocolized. We don't sort of wing it. Every kid, we do this every week. They all get the same exact treatment. And I really think it helps us to reduce the disease. Um, you've already seen Dr. Scott here. And, uh, you know, I, I do want to sort of highlight what he's done for the field. Um, this is a little cartoon of what we do. But as he mentioned, the two big differences are these peel sutures and the arachnoidal opening. I'm going to show a little movie here of what we do. So just to show you, we don't put the kids in pins. We do both sides under a single sitting if they're bilateral disease to reduce the anesthetic risk. We use Doppler to map out the parietal branch of the STA. Um, and then um, now this shows a knife. Actually, in the past couple of years, we've just used a Colorado needle directly on the skin, which saves time and bleeding, and I think is a little faster. So we use a Colorado needle. Um, and we go from the vertex down to the base, um, and we you know, leave a cuff on the artery of this sort of uh, tissue around it. Um, unlike with the direct bypass, we kind of strip it down to the adventitia, because this seems to be a substrate for ingrowth. And, um, you know, doing this approach, I think uh, we're able to really shorten this. We, it's about an hour to an hour and a half per side to do a synangiosis. And I think reducing the anesthetic time has really helped a lot. Um, we open a big, big flap as best we can under the galea there. The more brain you vascularize, the better. We try to get across the sylvian fissure so we get frontal and temporal lobe. We divide the temporalis into quadrants, again, just to have a bigger exposure. More brain is more revascularization. Um, we do the burr holes at the base and apex of the artery. I get very squinchy here. These are these arteries that we save with a fenestrated opening if there's transdural collaterals, but if not, the bigger we open, the better we do. I don't like to tuck them underneath uh, like the inverted dural flaps because I think the arachnoid isn't open and you run the risk of bleeding. Um, we do spend a fair bit of time opening the arachnoid here. Uh, we use a gry shaver blade, which I think is really, really helpful. Um, we use micro scissors, as you'll see here in the video, or sometimes just sort of teasing it apart. Um, it can be very challenging in these very injected brains, the syndromic kids, the kids with the RNF213 mutations, as you see here, this is the visual representation of what that IV sign really is. This hypervascularity in the sulci is what you see on MRI and, and really bespeaks to the maximal dilatation of these vessels. And that's why if they hyperventilate, if they cry, they vasoconstrict and get a stroke. So this is sort of the visual correlate to the radiographic findings. Uh, as Dr. Scott mentioned, we use these 10 nylons. Uh, we used to do, you know, a half dozen or so of these uh, to fix the vessel down. We've really tried to minimize those now, in part because they seem to stay pretty well with a few stitches. Um, it is a little harder with sickle kids that have a thicker skull from extramedial hematopoiesis. Uh, but um, the sutures are super important to keep the brain and the vessel uh, opposed to one another. Uh, and um, again, as Dr. Scott showed very nicely with his images, we just go just gently under the pia and we try to bridge the sylvian fissure and really open as many 
uh, clefts around the, the vessels and brain as we can. And then, as he said, put the dura leaflets back in place. We don't close the dura. And then just a piece of gel foam, both for CSF closure and also to prevent adhesions. So that's really the surgery that we do. And, and Dr. Scott pioneered, um, you know, the, the end result of all this work is that we've got this great ingrowth. This is an AP angiogram and you can really see that they grow like gangbusters if you've picked the right group. Um, the stroke rate drops from about 66 to 90% over five years, about four and a half percent. And so it's been a great clinical advance. Uh, this is Dr. Scott's image here. You see the ingrowth and, and it really seems to work over the long term. And as Dr. Scott mentioned, even followed 20 years, and this was another paper he published in the past year or two, um, these are incredibly durable radiographic and clinical responses. So the surgery works. And, and I really want to credit Dr. Scott for his pioneering in the field. That said, I think we're still failing a lot of kids. We can really do better. I mean, a lot of these kids show up, they're sick, they're not well. This is my lab across the street. And I do think that trying to advance the field and the lab at places like Miami and others is, is really important. Um, I've looked at axon guidance factors and just to veer a little bit into some of the science of what we're trying to do to better understand this disease outside of the operating room, axon guidance factors are these proteins they're secreted, they're involved in brain development. They influence these key things of migration, invasion, and angiogenesis. And those are great things when you're growing a brain, but they're crappy things when you have a tumor. And they usually act as a good guy and a bad guy. It's like Dr. Scott and Ed, you know, you got your agonist and your antagonist. And, and to sort of show some of the canonical proteins, because I'm a dumb surgeon, the scientists around me kind of dumb it down for me. But uh, basically, semaphorins are like the brakes. They stop angiogenesis. They stop invasion. And netrin is one of the big go guys. They, they promote angiogenesis. And we've looked at this in uh, brain tumors and endothelial cells, where these brain tumors tend to stimulate the growth of these. And this is great where these axon guidance factors, netrin, is, is a good thing for tumors, right? Tumors like them because the tumors invade and the tumors get blood vessels. And that's not a good thing clinically for tumors, but what about this mechanism in Moya Moya? And the idea there is this kind of invasion and angiogenesis is a bad thing clinically in tumors, but in the tumor cell, maybe you could also see it in the endothelial cell and have it be good for Moya Moya. And so we've investigated this yin and yang of this in the lab with the idea being when we do this part of the surgery and these blood vessels are growing in, could we harness this mechanism to <clears throat> excuse me, better get ingrowth of vessels and understand what's happening when Dr. Scott does his surgery or when Heather or Toba do, does the surgery. So what's going on under the microscope? And the hypothesis we have is that netrin, this go juice that is used to build a brain, might also be go juice in Moya Moya. And I'm going to try to make a little legal case here, like Lionel Hutz from The Simpsons, and just go through a few simple steps without getting too sciencey, uh, but with a very sort of simple set of, of ideas. The first thing is to say, all right, Ed, if you think this netrin molecule is a proangiogenic growing blood vessels, you know, chemical. Can we see it in endothelial cells? Does it make these cells invade more? You know, endothelial cells jazzed up if you give it stuff. Does it make more tubes? And does it recruit endothelial cells? So, so can you show me that it works? So the first thing we did is we said, okay, here's an invasion assay. We take some blood vessel cells, we sprinkle them in there, and then we add both Netrin-1, which is our challenger, you know, the, the new guy, and we compare it to the reigning champ VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. And what you can see is that with Netrin-1, this new chemical, if you will, there is a much larger response of these endothelial cells invading into the surrounding tissue. So it really does a great job and it does an even better job than VEGF. So this is very encouraging that Netrin does what we think it does. Um, so you add Netrin, you increase invasion and angiogenesis. The next thing we ask is, okay, if Netrin promotes angiogenesis, if that's the protein, that's the ligand, what about the receptors? The, do the brain cells, the endothelial cells in the blood vessels, do they have receptors to grab this Netrin? That's the, the science sign for, for ligands. You probably don't know, that's very, very fancy Harvard stuff. Uh, but the point is we look for these specific receptors 
for Netrin. And the big ones are UNC5B and Neogenin. Do they have the grabbers to attach to Netrin? Because you would think that those endothelial cells would have them. And sir, shooting, they do. And in fact, when we look at brain endothelial cells and compare them to endothelial cells from other parts of the body, what we see is that the brain endothelial cells actually have the specific receptors, neogenin and uh, UNC5C, that uh, grab and attach to uh, the Netrin-1 and promote invasion and angiogenesis. So they have the right receptors and they have the right proteins. So this is very exciting for us to see this in the brain and the field cells. When you do this practically, if you add Netrin, you get more invasion of these endothelial cells and more tube formation. You can see if you add Netrin, they start building blood vessels. Whereas if you block either the protein Netrin or you block the receptor neogenin, so either the upstream or the downstream, you break down that tube formation. So you, if you add it, it grows. If you block it, it decreases. And it also affects sprouting. So this is really encouraging because you have both a positive experiment, when you add it, it's better, and a negative experiment, if you block it, it's worse. And that's both the protein and the receptor. So if Netrin is involved, and if Netrin makes these cells do things in vitro, what about the mechanism by which it's working? How the heck does Netrin make these cells start scurrying around and growing new blood vessels? What's the mechanism? And so there is a, an endothelial, a, 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 a intracellular kinase, an engine called uh, ERK. Uh, and when it's phosphorylated, that's turning on the engine to make these cells go move around and do stuff. So if you see phosphorylation of ERK, that means that something has turned on the engine of the endothelial cell to make it build stuff. And again, we compared Netrin and VEGF, the, the reigning champ and the new challenger, as to how good it revs up this engine. And just like double mint gum or big red, you know, it lasts longer and stronger with a bigger response of this phosphorylation in the Netrin-1 than with VEGF. So this tells you a little bit of what the mechanism is when Netrin binds to the receptor neogenin, it turns on this kinase inside the cell and phosphorylates it. And that's how the cells start scurrying around to do stuff. And the last thing you say is, all right, Ed, that's really cool. You got fancy test tubes. You can make cells jump around through hoops. But is there real world evidence that this exists in moi moi patients? And you would hypothesize that in an ischemic patient in a hungry brain, that if it's making more netrin, hey, I'm hungry, bring me some endothelial cells, you should have more netrin in patients with um, moi moi. And in fact, that's exactly what we see if we look at the urine or the CS up of patients with moya moya compared to matched control patients, there's a heck of a lot more of this netrin around. This fertilizer is there in the hungry brain. And that's very encouraging. The last thing you might ask is, all right, Ed, well, if you treat them, then maybe that netrin level should go down as the new blood vessels grow in. And that's exactly what we see. Here are some patients with pre-op and post-op. Pre-op, they have high netrin. And at six months post-op, their netrin levels are starting to decrease. That's exactly what you would expect. And I can see you in the internet saying, well, hey, Ed, wait a second, two of those actually go up post-op. And in fact, you have good eyes, that's true. And the reason two of them went up is one had a pulmonary stroke and the other one went from unilateral to bilateral moya moya. So the idea here is that this could be a great marker of either response to surgery or development of new moya moya, for example, in a unilateral patient. So this has precedent. We've published this before. Um, you know, you could make the argument that Netrin is non-specific and it's only just a hungry brain. That's true. Uh, that's useful. But we also are in the process of defining a specific fingerprint for Moya Moya. We've published this for brain tumors where you can pee in a cup, look at the urine biomarkers, and we can tell with 98% accuracy, not only if you have a brain tumor, but what kind of brain tumor you have. And if you resect a brain tumor, you can see that the amount of resection correlates with the relative drop in biomarker levels. So we can specify this, I think, for Moya Moya more than just, do you have a hungry brain? Um, the last thing is using this therapeutically. We just published a paper um, in one of the nature journals showing this little liposome with an antibody specific construct, like a Trojan horse to deliver agents. And one hope would be you could deliver this to the site of surgery uh, to help build better blood vessels at the time of moya moya revascularization. So what are we gonna do with this work? 
Well, at the end of the day, I hope that the laboratory can build on, inform, and better make surgeons uh, capable for treating kids by knowing who we should operate on or not, answering that question of that 50% who needs it, knowing, making our operations better so we can enhance our surgical uh, effectiveness, and lastly, uh, you know, augment how we do things so that the surgery works uh, faster and better. We have an animal model of this now. We're hopefully going to have that be able to report in the next year or so, but it's very exciting. And uh, the last thing I want to end with, with my sort of short time here is, you know, does this matter? And, and I really want to credit Heather and, and Toba for organizing along with the rest of the group in Miami, these kind of educational meetings, because high volume centers and exchanging information affect output. This is an example of what high volume centers can do. People that do this a lot, that are experienced surgeons and that do research. And what we showed is that in the higher volume centers have shorter lengths of stay from Oyamoya patients. They're actually cheaper by about 57%. So even though we're some fancy pants, you know, big either Miami or Boston hospitals, we actually do it cheaper than some of the community hospitals. And most importantly, they have an eight fold better discharge to home. So less complications and almost a 16 fold reduction in death rates. So these kind of educational meetings, this kind of exchange of information, and along with high volume really affects patient outcome. And, and it's really great to be part of something like this. Um, the takeaways, you know, kids are different than adults. Um, age matters. Uh, I think it's a very exciting time to be in neurosurgery where we're learning a lot about what the diseases are that contribute not just to Moya Moya, but all of neurosurgery. Uh, we're getting better at evidence-based uh, metrics to drive our decision-making and outcomes. And I will comment that, that Mike's, Dr. Scott's original surgery is one of the great success stories in neurosurgery. It really works so well. And this is, this is one of those sort of unambiguous home runs. Uh, I hope to make the home runs even into sort of big poppy home runs through some advances in uh, biological therapy and, and understanding things. And this sort of collaborative multidisciplinary approach and these kind of big groups are, I think, the way to do it. So I think I finished in time. I wanna thank Heather and Toba again and, and everybody. And, and again, I wanna congratulate Dr. Scott for his great pioneering work in this. So thank you so much. Thank you to both of you. Those were both fantastic talks. Um, we hope the audience will uh, put through your questions so we can get uh, all of your questions answered and make this as interactive as possible. Uh, while we're waiting for those questions to come in um, from uh, some of us who are on, we'll start with some of our questions. Um, one thing I thought might be um, helpful is I know we've talked before about patients where uh, surgeons at lower volume centers have intervened too soon on an asymptomatic patient. Um, and you mentioned that if they have an IV sign, that's a clear indication that you should be moving forward. But what about the patient with some narrowing that seems to be progressing, don't yet have an IV sign? Sort of, could you comment a little bit on thresholds for intervening on, on those patients that might guide some people? Uh, Mike, you wanna go or you want me to go? What would you like? Why don't you go ahead with that? Yeah, I'm, so to your question, Heather, you know, how do you know when to intervene in early stage disease? It's always hard, right? Um, part of it, I think, is have they had any clinical symptoms or not? And I think if they had, as I mentioned in the indication slide, that would be a reason. Um, if they have just purely radiographic findings, um, I do tend to be a little more reticent. And uh, again, my decision point, not alone, but in large part is whether they have IV sign or not. Um, I do tend to get short interval re-imaging and we have a specific sort of 10 minute scan that we do just with diffusion and um, flare uh, that really helps us to understand, uh, you know, for these kids without sedation, you know, uh, whether they're progressing. So those are kind of the triggers. And then like a six month or less MRA, if I see progression and, you know, they're worse than I I would probably intervene. What I'm hoping is with a, the, you know, doing some trials with our urinary biomarkers, we'll better be able to identify an ischemic signature for the brain that might tell us who needs surgery and who doesn't. Um, and we just got a big burger grant with the American Heart Association to try to study that. So it'll take a few years, but I'm hopeful we'll be a little smarter down the road than we are now. One of the other issues here, uh, Heather, regarding that question is what technique are your radiologists using for their flare images? And one of the big surprises that we've had at Boston Children's was that they were changing the parameters of their flare studies. And all of a sudden, the IV sign that we were looking for was not 
apparent anymore on the, the scans and until we sort of talk with them a little bit about that. So, you know, these radiologic protocols are extremely important as well in determining who you're going to operate on. And that you have to work out with your radiology folks. Don't you think that's a case, Ed? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's so many pitfalls in the radiographic area, you know, hospital, mm. hospital, getting them lined up the same way. Uh, when they get propofol, they can get false positives for okay. IV sign. Um, you know, the, the sickle cell kids, I mean, there's, it really is important to standardize and, and know your study. So that's a great point, Mike. So one of the other questions that we have from the audience is um, if uh, Netrin would promote the development of aneurysm and abnormal vessels in sickle cells since their vessels are abnormal. Yeah, I mean, the sh sh so the question is, does, does Netrin, you know, promote bad stuff? And the answer is it, it might. Uh, one of the real problems with sort of nonspecific therapeutic uh, administration of these growth agents is that they do, they have unintended consequences, right? Um, and uh, this has been seen in VEGF and, and VEGF blockade, uh, you know, historically with tumors. So I, I do think that the strategy we're trying to use to minimize that is the idea of sort of receptor specific uh, intervention, because that way you have a much more focused profile and also localized delivery. So I, I think those are probably two strategies we've learned from the tumor world to minimize that. But I think just generally sprinkling nectarin on the brain is going to be horrible in terms of either seizures or edema or bad stuff. So I, I don't want that to be the takeaway message. Uh, but I do think the idea that those, that pathway is a good pathway to exploit is the message. It's just a question of how to do it in a targeted way. And that, that's where things like liposomes, antibody mediated delivery, um, maybe, you know, focal delivery through uh, intracerebral crisis, or, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but, but that would probably be my rough answer to that. And then to piggyback on that, there's a question from the audience saying, uh, do you think Netrin could be used as a pre-screen for all neonatal patients when Moya Moya is suspected? More so, can Netrin be used to predict stroke in high-risk adult patients, for example, those with intracranial atherosclerotic steno-occlusive diseases? Yeah, so the question of using Netrin as a biomarker to predict stroke or surgical efficacy is a great one. Um, you know, my answer to that would be number one, we're working on it. We just published our paper looking at Netrin amongst others as a marker for tumor. And, th and that was just published this year in neuro-oncology. So I, I do think there's validity to using it in the urine. The problem is it's extremely nonspecific, right? So it, it could be because of tumor, it could be because of ischemia. So I, I do think that idea of creating a fingerprint like we published before is probably most important for prognostic tools. Uh, to answer about the adult patient, you know, um, this is most likely based on our animal models, um, a chronic response to chronic ischemia. And so if you have someone, for example, with critical stenosis for you know, carotid disease or aneurysmal stuff where the flow is otherwise normal, you may not have that chronic ischemia and consequently the netrin may not be elevated, right? I mean, some of those folks don't have IV sign in their brain. So I, I do think that a metric for that specific biomarker is the concept of either chronic ischemia or tumor growth where the, it, it's ongoing for a while. So it might be good in some situations, it probably will be good in all. And I think creating a multi-pronged um, fingerprint is probably most important. Another question for both of you. Um, in general, obviously um, for pediatric Moya Moya, um, I know both of you, and I obviously share your bias since you trained me, favor indirect, um, but I know we've discussed before there are certain patients where um, there may be a role uh, for direct. Do you want to comment on sort of your thoughts on what the role is for direct in the pediatric population if there are subsets of patients? Mike, you want to go first? Yeah, well, I'm sure that, Heather, there are subsets of patients in whom that is a very applicable uh, procedure to do. I think the problem I've always had with the, the direct bypass is that if you do cut flow studies or you, you actually look at the amount of flow that's going in through those anastomoses, it's pretty small. And it's also it, it, when they do the, I mean, most people now, when they evaluate these patients perioperatively, they're doing endocyanine studies 
in the operating room perioperatively. And if they're doing angiograms, they're, they're not doing uh, the standard kind of angiogram lets you see what the contribution of that bypass is to the general all over cerebral flow. Uh, and I've always felt that, you know, what I love to see is the late results of these studies and where you have to, of these operations where the surgeon usually has to put an arrow at the point of the bypass to delineate it well enough that you can see where it is because Usually there's so much collateral coming in, in the pediatric population at any rate, from the indirect sources, from the meningeal vessels, um, and from the dura and, and so on. And, and I, so I, I've, I've got a very strong prejudice against this. And I also don't like the rapid hemodynamic changes that occur with this surgery, but I obviously don't know everything about this. And there, are, there must be some patients where when somebody's really deteriorating rapidly, you want to get blood in there in a hurry. It's probably one of your only options. The problem is the blood vessels in most of the kids are too small. If you're getting up into a 14, 15, 16 year older, then the, the equation starts to change. So I, I guess I would comment, I mean, you folks have a great group down there in Miami and you know your bypass is up and down. So I wouldn't presume to step on toes down there. Uh, that said, you know, the, literature, you know, you think about some of the other big groups like uh, Sepe Minhanjani and Fadi Chabelle at UIC, and they talk about the cut flow index that Mike mentioned, you know, looking at the rate of flow to keep the vessels open. And one of the problems is one of the groups that most needs immediate flow are the kids ages two and under, right? And we've published on that to say that they're extremely high risk. They're also the group that's most likely to fail in a bypass. So, cause they're so tiny. And I know Mike Lawton has published and he's an incredible surgeon, uh, but those bypasses do tend to fail or not work and they're very challenging. And once you've sort of lost that vessel, you reduce the ability to get ingrowth in another place, you kind of shot your bullet. Um, the second issue is, you know, a lot of these kids that, that are, have high grade stenosis, almost always a single bypass will be in a temporal region. And if that has to get retrograde flow to the sylvian fissure and then back up, and if you have moya moya narrowing at the fissure, you're getting a choke point and it won't get up to the frontal lobe where you need it. So I, I do think direct bypass occasionally has a role for the acute multiple strokes, but those tend to be the older kids that are almost adult sized anyway. And I also think operating on acute strokes are a bad idea. And we've generally adopted the policy of waiting a month or two after a stroke to let things cool down because with anesthesia, there's a higher rate of perioperative stroke in that short window right after. We just had a case from California that that exact thing happened with a direct bypass in a kid. So um, I think both biologically and um, historically, there's some evidence to go against it. Uh, you know, Gary, Dr. Steinberg, who is a wonderful surgeon as well. Uh, I mean, even he is sort of recanted from his near uniform direct bypassing kids as best I understand. And uh, so I do think there's a shifting tide in that, at least in kids that are, you know, in their teens and younger. Great. Thank you so much. Um, just wanted to start off by thanking Dr. Scott, Dr. Smith, so much for sharing with us your expertise and allowing us to understand more about your cohort and um, your extensive experience with this condition. Um, my question is about um, uh, development of moya moya after radiation. You spoke about moya moya development following conventional external beam radiation for hypothalamic optic pathway glioma and brain stem tumors. Um, in your experience, what is the prevalence um, and development time frame in addition to some risk factors um, to the development of moya moya after radiation to this area? And what do you do to capture this um, population of patients so that um, you're able to identify them years down the road? Mike, do you want well, to go? Yeah, I can answer some of that, but not all of it. I mean, I, I've been amazed at the varying periods of time that this phenomenon, the moya moya phenomenon develops after radiation therapy. And I also should say we've seen it after radiation uh, of every type, uh, you know, not just in the old days, the conventional external beam, but the, the very focused radiation, the gamma knife, the, the um, proton beam, and so on. And some of it has developed as, as rapidly as within a year or two after the treatment. 
So I don't know why that risk factor occurs. It may have something to do with the type of surgery that's carried out initially uh, and for which the radiation therapy was used. For example, a craniopharyngioma case that I'm thinking of right now off the top of my head where there was a very rapid appearance of the moya. Moya, there was a lot of dissection around the circle of Willis in that case. And there might have been some injury to the carotid arteries, or as we know, the carotid walls are very susceptible to change in surgery for craniopharyngioma, and maybe that's a factor. But in terms of identifying that patient pre or afterwards, it's it's hard to say. The one thing I would say is the the big thing that we as neurosurgeons have to do when we go to these neuro onc conferences is we have to pay a lot of attention to these scans that are going up. Mm -hmm. And they're looking, the, the folks in NeuroOnc are looking at them for the development of recurrent tumor. You know, we have to look at them also for the development of uh, IV sign or the development of uh, changes in the flow voids at the base, at the circle of Willis. And for unanticipated or unnoticed evidence of infarction, and uh, and uh, I think that's one of our big jobs there. But in terms of predicting those cases, I'm not sure I can say. I don't know whether Ed has a different thought about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a set answer, but I would say there are several papers that have been published on this, in, including one from our institution. And I would say the overall incidence of post-radiation induced moya moya is between about three and a half to five percent. So it's a very high rate, uh, and I think it's been under-recognized in the past. Uh, I would comment that the risk goes up with higher doses of radiation. I forget the exact number, but yeah. basically like after uh, I think 5,000 gray or centigray, like every hundred or so it increases like five or 10% or something. So there is a stepwise response. So that is the risk factor and that is the overall prevalence. Um, in terms of the risk cohorts, um, NF1 patients are three times more likely to develop post-radiation induced moya moya compared to non-NF1 patients. So that is very high rate. And then craniopharyngioma patients that have had high dose focal at the base of the skull, if they had a smaller craniopharyngioma, also tend to have um, higher rates of moya moya. The time I forget, I want to say most of them occurred within three years. Like it's a fairly fast onset. Uh, and I, you know, as Mike said, they can happen anytime, but but uh, there are several good papers. The last one was about a decade ago. I think Nikki Ulrich, uh, U-L-L-R-I-C-H, was one of the senior authors, along with some other guy that knows a little bit about Moya Moya. I don't know who he is. He might, he might be on this podcast with some glasses. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, uh, there are several papers, and those are the best numbers I know and the risk factors I know. So we, uh, we have a protocol here where we are uh, doing exactly that. We're looking for all of our neuro-onc patients. We are... Um, getting MRAs, um, if, especially if they've gone to the skull base, um, specifically with our craniopharyngiomas, any hypothalamic optic nerve glioma patients for that purpose. And, and we've seen not super high incidence, but it's something we're looking for more often uh, now here, which is good. Uh, so a question from the audience, uh, Dr. Khatib, um, he's asking, what is the etiology of the interventricular bleeding as a late complication in these patients? Yeah, well, you know, we don't know. Uh, and I, I, there's just no clue on the studies as to where this is coming from. I, we do know it happens and it's a phenomenon that's been described in uh, other countries uh, in late patients, but I don't know where it comes from. I have a feeling it's got something to do with altered collateral pathways because these patients that I've had have had very severe, I mean, they've got stage six Moya Moya, there's nothing going on intracranially. Uh, the only flow they're getting to their brains that you can see is through their operative sites, through their synangioses, and they've got severe disease everywhere. And you, you have to postulate that there's some hypertrophy somewhere that you can't pick up on the, on the, uh, and rupture of a susceptible vessel somewhere, but I don't know where it comes from. That I, uh, I'm hopeful that with better MRA techniques, we'll find out more about this. That's why I'm asking for people to keep an eye on their patients over time. Yeah. 
Um, if anyone else has more questions, please shoot them through. And then um, we had one question that was actually early on and we didn't mean to skip it. So I'll circle back. Uh, someone had asked whether hyperbaric oxygen uh, had any role um, in radiation angiopathy and its management. I'm happy to answer, Mike, but if you have a thought, you go first, I defer. No, I, I defer to you on that. <laughs> Horrible idea. Absolutely horrific, terrible, no good, very bad idea of all badness. So, you know, there's several I reasons for that. Um, you know, so we've had a few patients who, one, one particularly from Colorado that had a CSF leak and got hyperbaric oxygen and that helped heal that. Um, there are people who have talked about using hyperbaric ox oxygen after stroke for stroke recovery. And I'm not smart enough necessarily to debate that. I, I do think there's a little literature to talk about hyperbaric oxygen for like burn victims or wound healing, but is the opposite of what you want for moya moya collateralization, right? So high oxygen, low carbon dioxide induces vasoconstriction. And we've had three patients, including two from Israel that have had horrible strokes after hyperbaric oxygen. And I, my belief, and, and again, it's a little bit of hand waving, but I think it is the opposite physiology of what you want for inducing collateral growth and for maintaining the altered cerebral autoregulation that exists in a moya moya patient. So for those reasons, I think it's a terrible idea as a separate biology note or not biology, but as a, you know, an aside, this is my editorializing, not all, but many of the experiences I've had with these hyperbaric chambers are that they're for-profit companies. And I tend to feel as a little bit of shady, you know, again, this group in Colorado and another group in uh, Israel have been paying out of pocket for these treatments. And, you know, I, I just feel like there's a lot of badness both biologically and financially. So I would pretty strongly say, heck no. The next question is, uh, what understanding do we have regarding the pathophysiology of moya moya autoimmune versus genetic? Is there a reason for the predilection for East Asian populations? Mm. Do you want to take that or do you? No, I think in terms of the genetic stuff, Ed, I, this is about probably my weakest area of knowledge. Uh, in, you know, and, and this is, some of this stuff is pretty hard to understand how it, I mentioned that kid with that chromosome one inversion. I mean, what the heck is that? kid doing with Moya Moya disease. I don't understand that, but uh, I know there's a, there's a big, big genetic component that you've been looking at. Yeah. I mean, when you say looking at, it, I mean, there's a lot of smarter people than me, but you know, we've had a number of publications and studies. Uh, we've got one coming out with uh, the, uh, Dr. Milowitz, who's a big geneticist down in Texas. And, and she was the woman who originally identified the ACTA2 mutation in one of these cohorts. So, um, you know, the two part question, what, why East Asian specifically? And then generally, what are the sort of genetics here? I think the big theme we're getting, if you look at the more recently described mutations, the past five to 10 years, Gucci, NF1, ACTA2, uh, RNF213, the common theme in a lot of these are mutations involved in the actin monofilament pathways with smooth muscle cells, right? So the Gucci kids have achalasia in their central uh, cord, uh, their, their uh, esophagus. Uh, the ACTA2 people have smooth muscle dysregulation either in their aorta or in their brain, either with aneurysms or, or um, uh, moya moya pathophysiology. So I, I think that the, the takeaway is that they share this sort of end pathway, which is why a lot of them tend to look the same. And I think the central patterning of the way these vessels are grown, a great example are Down syndrome patients that have central pathology, right? Cardiac, um, uh, neck, uh, uh, thyroid, uh, moya moya, you know, and, and that's why the external vessels aren't affected and the central ones are. So I think it's my general picture of genetic background to Moya Moya. We, we also publish a paper in hypertension looking at um, uh, a number of different of um, uh, jagged and notch mutations in Moya Moya as well. Same idea, you know, migration. In terms of the East Asian population, you know, I'm not smart enough to explain why genetic drift is present. As you probably know, there are several subtypes of the RNF213 mutation that exist. Uh, and my guess is that it's more commonly just because within the shared population, there's genetic drift within that 
same group. There is RNF-213 mutational groups that have been described in European ancestry. There have been some in the US. Um, uh, so I, I think it's just more the penetrance of a given mutation within a group and not that there's something unique about East Asians that, that get it, if that answers the question. Yeah, it's always interesting to me that they're one of the big sources of papers in the Moya Moya literature has been mm -hmm. someone discovering that, oh yes, there's a big Moya Moya population in uh, North Africa, or there's a big Moya Moya population in Kyrgyzstan or something. I mean, this is something where diagnostic uh, diagnosis plays a big role, I think, in, mm -hmm. <laughs> in frequency studies. The Kyrgyzstan group has really written up. I mean, that's been something, I tell you, it's been burning up the airwaves. I'm kidding. Yeah. I, you know. I think, yeah. And, yeah. Bernard Sasha Cohen was out there, wasn't he? No, that was a different one. <laughs> Um, and, and then, then our the next question, question. Whoop, shall I, did you oh, have a sorry, question you wanted to ask? Or? A quick question. Along the same token, if somebody presents to you with Moya Moya with no known etiology, do you always send them to genetics for assessment? What's your policy on that? I know what mine has been, and mine was no, I hadn't because I didn't know where it was going to go, but Ed probably has changed. Yeah. Yeah, we actually, so the way our our, our clinic is set up is, you know, pre-COVID and even now, we generally have, you know, we have a large number of patients that are national or international. We usually have them come out on a Monday for an angiogram, a Monday um, a multi systems visit on Tuesday, which includes a neurologist, uh, a nurse practitioner, an anesthesiologist, myself. And we now have a neurovascular geneticist, Sid, who is just wonderful. And um, if there's any family history or, or any of the sort of syndromic tick, mock, tick marks that we see you know, on the exam, um, we get a referral and a visit to Sid. The reason is you know, it allows us to screen the other family members. Uh, and that's codified now in the 2019 American Heart Association guidelines and screening guidelines that are in there. We also published a paper with Chris Cayley uh, from Yale, who's uh, you know talking about that as well. Uh, the other reason is that, as you may know, the RNF213 variants and certain other groups have much higher likelihood of posterior circulation involvement and rate of progression. So that allows us to tell the family, for example, there's a one in six chance you might need posterior circulation surgery, whereas the sporadic sort of non-Asian families that don't have the mutations, they're much less likely to have that problem. And we usually say it's one and done here in the middle cerebral territories. So there's a lot of guidelines to that. And there are reasons because it changes both prognos prognosis screening and, and uh, you know, what the families can expect in the next few years. Great, wonderful, you, thank you. Can and you elaborate a bit on, um, on if the posterior circulation is affected, how does that affect your management? That was a, actually a question that uh, our fellow had here was, how does that change your management and how do you tailor the management if the posterior circulation is affected? Well, Ed and I can bounce, bounce this off one another. I mean, because we've had different opinions about this. I, I, you know, I've always, I've, I've not worried very much about posterior circulation involvement in my patients. And I've only had over the, the, the years that I was operating on these kids, I had very few patients that needed posterior circulation revascularization. There were some, but it's been a problem that people are paying much more attention to now. And I think, Ed, you've done a number of, of posterior fossil revascularizations. I think, I think I've only done five in 30 years. Yeah, we have somewhere in the order of about uh, close to 30-ish, I think. I'd have to, we, uh, uh, Ala just wrote the paper up. But I would comment that, um, you know, first of all, the, the cohorts that are most affected that we tend to see are very young kids. So under age two, they tend to have more severe disease. Um, I would comment that we have a number of kids that have basilar stenosis. So the facies kids, which are almost all female, um, and they will have some posterior circulation involvement as well. Um, and um, the other group, uh, what was the other group? There's the facies, the young kids. There's a third group that, oh, the RNF213 kids. Uh, and I, I don't know if we're just seeing more of them because of referrals or because of recognition, but those tend to be the three groups that I find in our little series are more likely to have problems in the back. So that's who we're worried about. In terms of what it does for our management, almost always, um, you know, we will treat the middle cerebral disease first because as Mike mentioned, sometimes if you have a really nice big surgery here and it works well, that will 
effect flow in the back of the head and you'll see the IV side recede and you go, we're all set. On the other hand, the kids that I've treated are not just our own native kids that have gotten worse back here, but sometimes the referrals from other hospitals where they have these little itsy bitsy, you know, pinhole crannies here, and then they get posterior disease, in which case we'll do grafting. Um, Skellig Stone did a nice paper looking at sort of, uh, you know, synangiosis back here using the occipital artery, and that works well. Um, increasingly, I've done pericranial grafting with dural uh, grafts as well, and that seems to work great. And the, I, the nice thing about it is it allows you to do a much bigger area without limiting your crany where the artery goes or trying to mobilize it. Um, and the last thing I'll comment is there does tend to be a fair bit of occipital artery spontaneous collateralization in some of these kids. So planning your surgery with stealth or something else sometimes can be a little helpful so you don't interrupt those collaterals. So that's the group, that's the management, uh, and uh, those are some of the tips at least I've learned through my mistakes. That's fantastic. Great, so um, we'll um, just include the last uh, couple questions here. Um, so uh, one person asked about continuing aspirin perioperatively, which I know you guys do. Um, and then, uh, so I'll just skip to the question after that, uh, which was, do you think it's possible for intraventricular hemorrhage to develop in term infants with Moya Moya disease or syndrome at or around the time of birth? Or does Moya Moya just generally present much after that time period in your experience? So I think they're asking whether some yeah, unexplained yeah. hemorrhages in the term period could be undiagnosed Moya Moya. Wouldn't it be nice, huh? <laughs> yeah, at least we'd have something to treat in those kids. I don't think I've ever seen that uh, uh, in, a, in a neonate. Uh, Ed, I, have you? No, I mean, I think the youngest I've operated on is maybe three and a half months I'd have to look. I mean, and that was a bit of a, you know, they were really sort of continuing to stroke out. They clearly had some narrowing. But yeah, that was not a hemorrhage. Or, or intra, you know, intrauterine hemorrhage. I don't know what I've ever seen. Yeah. And I would think, I mean, you, you've already talked about the fact that pediatric population tends to have stroke more than hemorrhage. So uh, yeah. that might skew away from that as a possibility too. Yeah, I think in our original series, I think we had eight hemorrhages and, uh, and you know, uh, hundreds of strokes, ischemic strokes. Well, I think we're wrapping up now. We're at 630. So I want to thank you both for your time this uh, this evening. Um, this has been an incredible talk from both of you. We're very lucky and fortunate to have you guys give this talk. Um, so thank you for your time and thank you to everybody who joined us uh, this evening. And thank you. Thank you very much. This, this was wonderful as we knew it would be. It, it's great to have you share your insights on this uh, with a group, <laughs> nice Ed. Um, yeah. And then we did also just want to let everyone know um, who's here. Um, our next uh, seminar uh, will be on Monday, February 8th at 5 p.m. Um, and that one is going to be focused on craniosynostosis. Uh, so we're going to talk both about endoscopic and open approaches and some of the pros and cons uh, of both of those. So we'll be getting that flyer out soon uh, with our expert panel for that. Well, thanks very much from us. We had a great time. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, Thank great you so much for such an enjoyable talk. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Have a great Bye. night, guys.